Yeah, we are here at the Radden Residence, R-A-D-I-N, located in Saugerties, New York, and today it is uh, September 28th, uh, 2005, and we are interviewing Ed Radden, who's a World War II veteran, whose birthday is tomorrow. Tomorrow. How old are you going to be tomorrow, Ed? Tomorrow, 87. 87 years old. Also present is Alan Brzezinski. I don't admit to that. I only admit to 29. Okay. It's like Jack Benny. Also present is uh, Alan Grzynski, who's handling our camera, and uh, Mrs. Radden is here as well. And I'm Bill Payne, interviewing on behalf of the uh, American Legion Post 72, Saugerties, New York. So, Ed. Yes. Thank you for sharing your memories with us. We appreciate it. Oh, I forget half of them. I'm going to ask you, were you, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was selected. You were selected? To spend one year in the armed service, but it took me four years and ten months to get out. And um, They extended it a little bit. They extended it a little bit. This was the first draft, you told me, before yes. World War II? Mm -hmm. My number was 659. And where were you living at the time you were drafted? I was living at uh, Ozone Park, Long Island. Ozone Park, Long Island. Yes. And you were born in Brooklyn? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And um, once you got drafted, you didn't have a choice of what unit you'd serve with? No, uh, we was just selected to go in the service. Mm -hmm. I went to, uh, up to Jamaica and got on a Long Island train and went to Camp Upton. And at Camp Upton, they gave us a physical and issued us uniforms. The uniforms that they gave us at that time were the World War I wraparound leggings, the old coat with the buttons up here. So, then so the U.S. Army uniform at that time was right. practically the World War One uniform, right? Right. Okay. So after that, in about uh, well, April the tenth, we uh, got on the train, and they said to wear all your O.D. clothes and your overcoat. So we said, wow, we're going where it's cold. So we got on the train, but where did we land? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. In April of 1941. April of 1941. Now yeah. they put us out in a marching field, and there was roughly a couple of thousand men. And they start calling you off by name and assign you to companies like uh, a Company, B Company, C Company. Well, it was so hot and standing there with the overcoat time that the guys were just passing out. It, it was, it was warm. So after that, they assigned us to the companies, and I wound up in Company B. And lucky enough. In Fort Jackson, South Carolina, they call it Sand Hill, and that's what it was. Just one big mound of sand and one tree. And lucky enough, that one tree was on the company as I was in. And there's four barracks, first, second, and third, fourth. So it was good, so when you went out to town and you come back, you got off the bus, you'd have to walk to your barracks. We could always find ours because we could look for the tree. <laughs> if it wasn't for the tree, we'd be still walking. You remember your instructors? I remember one. I, I had his name when I was talking to Marie, but I forget it now. The poor fellow got our manoeuvres got burnt up. So, I mean, I think it's, uh, I, can't, I can't think of it. How did he get burned up? Huh? How did he get burned up? Uh, in the barracks. We, we had a fire and he got burnt up. Did he, he didn't get out. Did he die? Yeah. yeah. How'd you get through boot camp, okay? Uh, it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. We had it every Tuesday. We took a five-mile hike, and you would run a mile and walk a mile, and you had to wear your gas mask. But on Friday, 
every Friday we had a 25 mile hike, but that had a full pack. You had all your equipment with you, extra shoes, blankets, rifle, and I was very fortunate. I never fell out on a hike because they say once you fall out, you always fall out. I, I didn't fall out. So you graduated from boot camp? Yep. And it, it, uh, we were the first draftees into the regular army, and I'm telling you, those regular soldiers weren't too kind. They made you work. We had fellas that were in World War One, giving us bayonet training, and uh, it was quite an experience. But I survived. This is the uniform that you had at that time uh, in the army. Yeah. Okay. We're going to hold it up to the camera, and uh, that was a uniform that was sort of a transition between the First yeah. World War and then later in the Second World Second War. World the War. uniform changed a little bit more. You notice we had a white shirt and a black tie. Right. And at that time, you could have all you a civilian in the barracks. You, you had the beds one right after another, and you had your clothes hanging up. You could have a civilian suit hanging up. So you go down to Fort Jackson on a Saturday night, and there'd be 10,000 guys with no soldiers. <laughs> Everybody was in their civilian clothes. Now you served uh, in World War II, so you were actually already in the Army on December 7th, 1941. Well, Can you tell us about that, please? Yes, I can. I happened to be in the barracks Sunday afternoon, just messing around, and the other fellows went to town. Well, all of a sudden, they said war is declared. We're going to pull out, go downtown and get the guys back. So I got in a taxi and I went downtown and I went to uh, Fort Jackson, it was just a block long, that I went to the spots where I knew where they'd be and I got them to come back. And about four o'clock in the morning, we packed all our clothes, packed our, got a hundred rounds of ammunition with bandoliers and clips. And we had these old soldiers there from World War One. Take everything because you'd never come back. So, which we did. So we got on a truck and we drove out. And it, the, the truck pulled up to a railroad bridge that was about as long as this house and dropped five of us off. And what we did, we put a pup tent on one end and a pup tent on the other other end, and we were supposed to guard the bridge in case anything happened. So we had one guy, two guys on this end, two guys on that end, and one guy walking in the middle, and we were taking turns. We were there, I'd say, roughly about three weeks, and we didn't see anybody. All they did, they come out and gave us a case of K-rations. And we cooked our own food. After that, we went back to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. From Fort Jackson, South Carolina, we went to Florida. But before, yeah, to, to Florida. And we, I was stationed on, they broke up our battalion all along the Keys. Because that's, that was after the war started. So, we were stationed on Pigeon Key Island. The island was about as big as this house and had two barracks on it. But we stood guard. We were on what they call a seven mile bridge. And we had four guys on one end, four guys on the other end. And the guy walk up to the middle, wait for the other guy to come and come back. But as we were stationed there, we'd station along the point, and we had a drop line so we could fish. We parted over, 
and have our rifle here. Well, we were very fortunate that it was such a very long, straight part that we'd stand there, and then when somebody would come, we'd have to pick up a rifle and stand up. As soon as he went by, we put it down and continued fishing. Well, that lasted, I guess, about two months. And from there, she got it. I got the right. We went back to Port, Carolina, uh, Port Jackson, South Carolina. Oh, I'll tell you a funny story. War was declared, and when we went out, all the fellas that were over 28 didn't go because they were supposed to be discharged. We were in for a year, we were supposed to get out. Well, the young guys like me went on guard duty. But the finance department closed up so they couldn't pay them off. It was the weekend. So they were held in. What happened? We come back, and instead of them getting discharged, discharged they got back in with us and stayed with us till we went overseas. We went to Arizona and took desert training. We have a picture of you here in Arizona in the desert training, right? This is, yes, this is quite a place for the mm -hmm. simple reason. If they drop you up on a truck, uh -huh. or when we got out there, mm -hmm. trucks went out and they yeah. said, this is Camp Laguna. Yeah. Now this was in the middle of the desert, a hundred and four, uh, 45 miles from uh, camp, uh, from up, the, not up, the, um, Yuma. Yuma. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to set up the tents, and I said, that's Camp Laguna. Lovely. I'm getting all these letters from home, air-conditioned barracks, and we're in tents sleeping on the ground. We didn't even have cots. Gee, I got pictures of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, after taking the desert train, oh, in the desert training when we got there, the first, the general orders were the longest march we was going to have would be five miles. That was fine. But before we left, we took a six mile problem. And the six mile problem was they gave the battalion commander a map. And on the map there was five spots and that's where the food was. So you had all day to march up to that spot and get the food. But they were a little tricky. You'd start the march and as you get there they say, oh, this is a minefield. You can't go through there. So you'd have to turn to the right and though the food was over there, you had to go back about another 10 miles to get across the minefield and then come back and get your food, stay there for the night and just sleep in the tent. There they had sidewinder snakes, rattlesnakes, helium monsters, anything you name. They had, oh, black widow spiders, and we were sleeping on the ground. So that was over. So we're moving again. This time we're going to Tennessee. We're going to the Tennessee maneuvers. And now it's winter time. So we get into Port Leonard Wood. You can't get in the barracks. They're being deliced. Where they bring us? Out on the rifle range. You're going to sleep in pup tents. In the it was way below zero out in Finland. So I winded up, we slept three in a tent. We had 14 blankets that we slept in between. I went to bed with everything I had, even my tie, hat, and gloves, and slept in the middle. It was cold. Eventually you got to sent overseas. Yeah. How'd that then, happen? Then we went to 
Uh, supposedly from Jer uh, Jersey. Uh, Dix? Dix, Fort Dix. We yeah. sent the foot. But before that, we were from Fort Leonard Wood, um, mm -hmm. and from Fort Leonard Wood, we went to Dix. And in Dix, we were all set uh, to go, go over. And during the day, you're horsing around, having organized athletics. So kidding around, I had a buddy that was about six foot two. And we're kidding boxing. I jump on his back and I'm hit, hitting him in the stomach. But with that, he falls. And he fell on my foot like that and just straightened everything out. He picked, it, picked me up and carried me over to the dispensary, which they sent me to the hospital. And they had no room in the... Uh, Where well, they had all the Ward? all the guys that were sick. Wards. The wards. Mm -hmm. So I slept out in the hallway that night. Next day they got me and they put a cast on the leg and they put me here. Well, I was supposed to go over. This was before D Day. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> being at my outfit left, my orders were. I couldn't write home and tell them that I didn't go. Because before that, they were giving us passes. And they would I'd go home for 24 hours and you go back. Well, when I went home, I told my mother, if I don't come back tomorrow, that means I left. So they figured I left. They'd send me cigarettes, chocolate bars, and I'm in a hospital having a wonderful time. So eventually, the, the 8th Division landed in England, in uh, Lake Hamp, uh, Wade Hampton. So I stayed in the hospital and my mother and father used to come out and see me on the weekend. And I can remember my mother, they had she there and they'd go come in by bus. So my mother used to say, Eddie, why is that guy going along with a stick and stick it in the ground? My father said, he's picking up cigarettes. He's, he's on duty. So I eventually got out of the hospital. And when I got out of the hospital, I was in rough shape. I could hardly walk. And the nurse there said to the doctor, he shouldn't go. And the doctor said, goodbye. So I went out and I got on the bus and I went to a, a replacement depot. That was all fellows that were left behind. Well, my outfit went over and if I was, I would have been in D plus four. That's when they went in. So I stayed in the depot, and like it was different outfits would come into the port of Peacock deparkation, and when somebody would get hurt, I would have to go. They'd call me to fill his space. But when I go up there, they'd look at me and they say, "No, you can't go." Okay, that went on for about two weeks. So then I go back and I'm in a replacement depot. All of a sudden they come and they call me, you're going up to Fort Miles Standish, Port of Embarkation. So I go up to Port, uh, Port of Embarkation up there. The doctor looks at me and gives me a wave goodbye. <laughs> he didn't even look at my leg. So I wound up in England, England in a wee depot. You went over on a ship? And over on a ship, I went over on a, an English ship, Thomas H. Barry. Thomas H. Barry. And we had English food, which was awful. Awful. So then when I was over there, I was in the re depot. They sent me, they needed replacements up in the 310th Infantry, A Company. So I got. 
up there to, to them. And they were at a standstill for two weeks. They didn't do anything. We were just standing there. So the first sergeant comes. We, two of us, report to the first sergeant. He says, "Okay, you're you're now on A Company. Come with me. I'll give you a position. You stay on the front line tonight." This was in France. This, yes. Mm -hmm. So we go up. And there's a foxhole, Doug. He says, okay, you sit on this and you sit on that and that. And that's the way we spent the first night on the front. He on one end, he on the end, with our legs wrapped around him. And <clears throat> needless to say, we didn't sleep. So the next day we wake up and we got some engineering tools, a shovel, and we dug a foxhole. That was, oh, I'd say about six by six and about four foot deep. We went downtown <clears throat> and went to, through the buildings <clears throat> and we got a ship around. And we brought, carried it back to the front with us. And when we got back there, we knocked out the back and put it over a foxhole. So at night when we'd go to sleep, we could button it up. They couldn't, the Germans, the Germans were only, I'd say, you could see them walking over there about a mile down. But they were stopped and we were stopped. Nobody was mad. And we heard some shooting. And the next, well, two days later, three days later, we had venison. For the cook come up. They would try to give us one hot meal a day. The cooks would bring it up to the front and they'd give a call a couple of guys to go back. And when they go back, they'd give you a change of socks and uh, a hot meal in your mess kit. So then, oh, that was in different battles. I went to, truthfully, I can't remember the ones that were in. But were you in the uh, you were in France during this time? Yep. I just from the France going into Germany. Going into Germany, huh? But into Germany, when we went into, into we went into Belgium. Into Belgium. From Belgium we went into Germany. Were you in Belgium at the time the Battle of the Bulge happened in the yeah. winter? Can you tell us about that? Well, the Battle of the Bulge, I was as I say, we were standing still for two weeks. But I was on the extreme then. I'll tell you how thin our line was stretched. I was in A Company and this was in B Company. I would say about roughly five miles. Every hour, two guys from A Company would walk up this way. And when they got there, they'd stay with B Company. Two guys in B, not two guys, five guys would walk back this way and keep in touch with A Company. There's nobody in between. Well, this one time when I was lucky enough to be walking, we were walking and our time got messed up. And the other five guys were coming from the other end. And in the middle, we left, we met. And fortunate enough, nobody was tricked or happy that they didn't fire at the other five guys come. We challenged them, gave them the password, whatever it was, monkey do or something. And we went to a company. I stayed there. Then all of a sudden, uh, we were at the Shemanuel Dam. We were supposed to protect that so uh, they wouldn't flood, flood, the, flood the dam. So we left there by truck and came, came around the back and went out on the plains. We got off there, they said, now you're attached to the Ninth Armored. So as an infantryman, the armored moves up and the infantry walks alongside them. Well, when they got up to the, all over the Cologne Plains, 
it was channels. And when they get to say channels and the tank couldn't make it, the infantry would go by and drive the men back and let the tank come up. Well, then when they come up, you could get a ride. So I hitched on the back of it. But before that, I got up to the Remagen Bridge. Oh, I, I got up on the tank and I jumped off and I hurt my leg. And that's in between there, I was, went into the Remagen Bridge. I went there about oh, a block away, and that was enough for me. I could hardly walk. I went back and they sent me back to a hospital down in Paris, France, La Haye de Puy. And that's when I was in the, the hospital in France. After I come out of the, the, the hospital, uh, while I was in, uh, I went to a replacement depot. Mm -hmm. That was his here with the, these fellas. They're all ex-combat men that have been reclassified. This is your picture right over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You That's, mentioned this man had received four Purple Hearts? Yeah. He was with the 101st. Mm -hmm. He was you, a jumper. You were awarded the Bronze Star and the Combat Infamous Badge? Yes. What was the qualifications for the Combat Infantryman's Badge back then? Staying alive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's it, staying the alive. Enemy, the enemy in combat, right? <laughs> you you, you got to be in a, a jump off. Mm -hmm. The amazing part. Yeah. My son, who's a one-star general, I keep kidding him all through life when he was a young boy to hear about my PFC strike. So when he got in the service, he went to West Point, and he graduated in 76, and he became a second lieutenant. I said, Bob, he beat my PFC strike. <laughs> so now all the way along, he's a one-star general, and I said, Bob, you beat my PF strike. <laughs> but just remember, I never lost it. I kept it. And you were so, also awarded the Bronze Star Medal? Yeah. What, how did that occur? How did you get the Bronze Star Medal? Staying alive. Staying alive. Okay. You told me a story about uh, how you managed to obtain some better food while you were in this program oh. here. Can you tell us that, please? Yes. This is a, this is a Saturday night. You can see a loaf of bread and this case here. Well, this here, we were attached, I was attached to the 10th Air Depot Group. Girlfriend headquarters. Girlfriend headquarters. Right. And Saturday night, well, first of all, we were on the first floor, and this, we were stationed in, would be almost like a garden apartment. Mm -hmm. So, which, I, I'm, I'm in there, and I got one room, and then my cot is in the, I, this is the Air Force now, this is mm -hmm. not the infantry. You got the, so the, the food was stationed underneath us. So we cut a trap door and we could lift it up, go down, help ourselves to a loaf of bread and some salami or something like that. And we had a barrel. My job was mine a barrel of beer. I had a barrel of beer in the corner of my bar room, which I kept inspection. <laughs> the way we used to, when the barrel of beer was empty, I tell the guys we need another one. Now with these 22 fellas, they were all combat men. They all got different jobs. Me and two other fellas got assigned to working with the, PA, with the Red Cross. Two guys were assigned uh, driving the general. Being this was the Air Force, they had, they had a bar room. So two guys were bartenders. So we had all the most important jobs. And we had trading. They used to make ice cream on Sunday. 
So the guy come down, we give him a gallon of ice cream, he give us PX rations. So the two fellows that drove the general would come and get the barrel of beer, and they'd have the, the red star on the front of the car and the barrel of beer in the back seat. They'd drive, drive down to the brewery in the, this German town and take the flag up with the red star, drive through the MPs, go in, get a full barrel of beer, put it back into the, the car, drive back out, get back out, put it back on the back of the star and drive up to my barracks and we take out the barrel of beer, which is for next Saturday night. You mentioned, I see in this picture here, that you were inclined to drink your, your beer out of uh, mason jars. Mason jars. Right? That's, right. That yeah, was so a, <laughs> a great tradition <laughs> for American GIs and uh, folks in the uh, rural areas to do. Now, after you were with the Air Force for a while, did you go back to the infantry? No. The reason I got in the Air Force, uh, I, uh, I say, say, uh, hurt my ankle. If you were given a disability, if, if you were over 10 percent, they'd send you home. But if you were 10 percent, you could do a day's work. They'd keep you. I had 10 percent, they'd keep me. So that's how I got into the Red Cross, but which was nice. I had all the coffee, all the donuts, and all the ice cream I wanted. You mentioned to me earlier you had some German prisoners making the donuts. Yeah, we had. Can you tell us about well, that? that. That was the part we we had two American Red Cross women that we were working with. Actually, staying at standing guard. We had the, the three Germans that did the cooking, and we had the German girls doing. Uh, Cleaning the USO, whatever the hell it was, heck it was. Uh, when uh, we were in Germany, we used to go down to the Salvation Army and get a cup of tea and crackers, and they'd, they'd come up to the front, and no, they didn't come up to the front. We went to the back and they gave it to us. The Red Cross charges a nickel for a cup of coffee. Where were you when the war came to an end? When the war came to an end, I was in, uh, I was in Germany, Gosley, Germany, uh, with the 10th Air Depot Group. Well, they were being discharged with points. Uh, they were discharging them with 80 and 90 points. I had something like 140, but I was still there. The way they used to discharge it, they sent you to different camps, and the camps were named cigarettes, uh, Camel, Lucky Strike, Chesterfield. You know, I got sent to Lucky Strike. I stayed there for, I could say, a week, and then they finally said, you're going to go home. Well, the ship I went back with was uh, the Volcania, and I went back with the 10th Air, Air Death of Group. But there was different outfits going on the ship, and the way there was, and we had a bunch of nurses going back. So the way they assigned us, this was a, an Italian luxury liner. So the way they assigned us was. The first 200 were MPs, the second 200 were KPs, the next 200 had to clean the, the ship. Well, I was lucky I was with the MPs. But with that, I, it was all, I didn't know anybody. I, uh, I met four Italian fellows that could speak Italian, and this was an Italian ship, and they had Italian help. So 
we got very friendly with a couple of guys. So with that, and being that we were on page, we made arrangements with these Italian guys that you'd knock on the door at one o'clock, and would open up the door, and the table about the size of this table would be set with a white tablecloth, flowers in the middle, and we would have a steak dinner with mashed potatoes and some kind of vegetable and pie a la mode for dessert. And we'd give them a dollar a piece. Well, that went on all the way till we landed back here. That was, I guess, about five or six days. But we had a steak dinner every day. We only had one meal, and that was enough. So came to Camp Kilmer. They said, you're going to be discharged. They don't look at my ankle or anything like that. Goodbye. You're out. So I'm out. But it's always been in my mind. How did I get reclassified from the Air Force to the infantry? I never heard it. Because, oh, I'll tell you another story. The way I found out I was in the Air Force, we were in this hotel, sleeping on cots, and this first sergeant comes and knocks on the door. Good morning. I want to welcome you fellows. You're now in the Air Force. You're no longer in the infantry. Stay in bed. So we stayed. We were on our own. We didn't do anything. Then they finally left, left us, and they sent me to Camp Lucky Strike. And that's when I got discharged. They sent me to Camp uh, Fort Dix, mm -hmm. and they discharged me. And you came home. And I came home. But I'll tell you another story. We're in England. Now, I went over as a replacement. I didn't know anybody for beans. And I'm, oh, I'm meeting different guys, and everybody's going down, down to London. So I said, i got to get to London. But I got no money. My pay was looking for. So I went to the Red Cross. And I told him I want to go down to England, to London, to meet my brother. My brother passed away when he was dead. So they said, OK, we'll lend you a pound, $4.20. But you got to pay it as soon as you get paid. OK. I go to London have a good time. And I meet, meet this fellow, John Doherty, right? We went to see him. And John Doherty was a dice stem. He used to play dice, and I got very friendly with him. So with my pan, we went partners. Well, you know, in England, you don't have coins. You have the paper money. And you don't have a dollar, you have a pound. But the pound is four dollars. So when you're betting two to one, you're betting eight dollars to four. So Doc is a strictly a, a no, uh, no better. I mean, a, against the dice. So he went to Red Cross, when after I met him, he used to play with, they had a uh, dice board as big as this table, one of the guys made. So he used to play, he'd win a couple of hundred dollars, he'd give me two hundred dollars, and I'd go in and go to bed, <laughs> and he'd play until till he, till they stopped. Well, we went to, Red, to the Red Crew, went to London one night, this is after I met him. And as a safety thing, you used to ch check your money. So I got my 140 pounds. He got his 140 pounds. The Red Cross girl almost died. You say you did go visit him after you got so out of service? Doc, uh, father ran a very 
good restaurant down in Atlantic City, mm -hmm. and he took over. So we went down there to see Doc, and we had dinner, and went to his house and spent the night with him. And that was the last time I met anybody. We have to get out of the service. What'd you do? I went. <laughs> I went back to Colson with Precision Instruments. That's where you were working before? Right before. They gave me a letter for a deferment mm -hmm. because I worked in the aircraft factory. Yeah. But they, they wouldn't accept my deferment. They said bye bye. So I go back there, and the rules were if you went back before the 90th day, you got your job back. So it's the 89th day. I walked back, I said, I'm back here for my job, come on, come on, come to work the next day. I said, wait a minute, you got to give me another week to straighten my affairs out. So I got another week. I was on the 5220 Club, and when you went to the 5220 Club, which is like $52, that was a lot of money at that time. So I used to go up there, up to Jamaica, Long Island, Long Island, to the Unemployment Bureau, and you'd have to sign every week, and they'd say, did you go out looking for a job? Yes. What kind of a job do you want? I want to be a cable, cable splicer's helper with the telephone company. You can't get that kind of job. <laughs> so I ran it for 90 days. But this picture that you see here, mm -hmm. my cousin, the fellow with the Air Force, he ran it for a whole year. Well, 52 weeks, huh? Yeah. $20 a week for 52 weeks? 52 weeks. And who's the sailor? That's my cousin. Uh-huh. That's, and that's, and that's me, you. and that's my other cousin. Uh -huh. That's three of us, three all, branches of service. They all came back okay from the service? Yep. Yeah. Now, uh, did, what did you finally do for a career afterwards? I went to Colesman, mm -hmm. near to Colesman. I went to work with, uh, I quit there. I went to work with my father in the uh, art, art color printing company. Mm -hmm. I stayed there and I got my apprenticeship. Did you get the GI Bill with that? No. No? Just went through an apprenticeship? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, I got a, I didn't think, wait a minute, I did, I got GI tools. My dad did. I just happened to think. Yeah, he was I, a, I got a ruler, had a, yeah. a magnifying glass. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. my dad was an apprentice printer yeah. when he, and he got GI Bill. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. I served in apprenticeship with the photo engravers. Mm -hmm. Now, in the photo engravers, they got a six-year apprenticeship. Every year, you went to a different department. You went to the etching department, you went to the stripping department, you went to the photography department, and the layout department. The last year you stayed in the department that you were going to be assigned to. Mm -hmm. I was assigned to be a photographer. Uh, so I saved my six years apprenticeship, I stayed there, I was fortunate. I made pretty good money. <laughs> I was coming back and forth to Saugerties on Saturday. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I met my lovely wife, my next door neighbor. Marie, yeah. Mm -hmm. My attorney. I always have my mouthpiece with me. <laughs> How long have you been married now? Now we're married 55 years. You got it. You mentioned that you have children? Yes, we mm -hmm. have four children. I have Edward, who's 50. <clears throat> he's a lawyer, he's a managing attorney up in Rochester. Mm -hmm. I have Bobby, who's, who's the second one, which is five years later, no, the general, general. We have Jimmy, who's. Age? Uh, his, uh, he's vice president of McCormick, and we have my young, like, lovely daughter. Got to change things after a while. Outside of that, I'll tell you what. 
I've always said before before the war, if they would have a country and have the guys for a year, I would volunteer my sons in the service if they could go in and come out as well as me. Oh, by the way, I'll tell you another story. I've always worried how they tr transferred me from the Air Force to the infantry. It's been on my mind since I was discharged in 1941. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I go, uh, go up to the Veterans Administration, uh, right. mm -hmm. and I'm up there, and I get down to where they have, what was it, the GI records? GI records. records. Mm -hmm. I said, I, you know, I want to find out something. I've been reclassified from the Air Force yeah. into the infantry. I want to know why. Mm -hmm. It's been on my mind. So they said, come back in a week or something, we'll send for your records. So I come back in a week, they send for my records. Oh, yeah. You broke your leg the second time. You were reclassified and you got a 10% disability. So, so I found out I had a 10% disability. You never found out exactly why, though. That my leg was no good. Well, Ed, I want to thank you a lot for sharing your reminiscences with us and thank you for your service. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Yeah, hard to say.